Part 2 Chapter 4 Space Bullies Jax lingered on the Relief Corps station for a few hours, while Rudy oversaw a crew of cleaning droids. In the cantina, some of the aid camp workers treated him to a round of drinks as thanks for rescuing them. When he staggered back to the Osprey, he had Skip take care of departure while he crawled into bed. Jax, wake up! Skip said loud enough to wake his boss but not scare the life out of him. No alarm sounded. What's wrong? Jack sat straight up. He immediately reached for his trousers, lying at the end of the bed. I dropped us into local space to make our final course adjustment and stumbled onto a lurking Imperial patrol. They've set an intercept course, twenty minutes out, and they're hailing us, Skip replied his voice moving from speaker to speaker as Jax moved down the corridor past the other two crew berths, through the lounge, and up the stairs to the flight deck. Jax finished putting on his shirt, an old space rogues shirt he picked up in a market on Ross 128B. He wasn't a fan of the movies, but he enjoyed the books his mom had given him on an old reader device. Let's see him, he said, disengaging the auto flight systems and powering up the displays set into his console. The screens blinked to life, showing an Imperial Capital ship. Great, Jax mumbled. One of the big ones. On the screen was the wide mushroom cap forward section of an Imperial Adjudicator-class cruiser. The wide forward section was almost as wide as the entire ship was long, just over a kilometer of Imperial muscle. Even at the relative distance still separating the two ships, Jax could see the heavy weapons lining the forward section in concentric rings along the stark white hull. He tapped the blinking indicator that showed the holding call. Hi, sorry for the wait. I was asleep. This is Captain John Smith of the Rambler. How can I be of service? From the speakers, a gruff voice replied. Independent vessel Rambler, this is the INV-1215 Adjuster Car. Prepare to come aboard for an inspection. The line didn't immediately close. Then the voice came back. As your vessel is armed, we'll require a tactical systems lockdown beginning now until you depart. Another indicator lit up, showing the waiting override of his weapons systems. Jax tapped the button to mute the comms. Fucking assholes. He turned to look over his shoulder at Rudy. Ready? Lacking a neck that allowed for nodding, Rudy did what rock hoppers had been doing for centuries when mining asteroids in thick suits. He raised his hand and bobbed his fist up and down. Yes, would have worked, Jack said, smiling. He lifted his finger. I'm afraid I'm going to have to pass. We will shoot you down. Prepare to come aboard. The channel closed. Oops, must have gotten disconnected, Jack said, as the massive warship slid out of view through the transparent titanium windows wrapping the front of the flight deck. They're charging weapons, Skip reported, then added, Shields up, weapons hot. A warning light came on. They've locked on. Jax brought the Osprey around in a tight corkscrew as charged plasma began streaking past the ship. Several bolts of energy struck the shields, causing warning icons to light up across most of the consoles as the ship shook. The bridge lighting flickered. We won't last long taking direct hits, you know, Rudy quipped. I'm built for speed, not head-to-head -head combat, Skip added. Shut up, both of you, Jack said, as he brought the Osprey back on an intercept course with a much larger warship. He put the nimble Valerian co-op infiltrator into a corkscrew. Charged plasma dashed against the shields, causing them to flare. A display showing shield strength started flashing yellow. Jax pushed the throttle all the way forward. The Imperial ship grew quickly, its weapons batteries becoming visible. Hold on! I'm magnetically attached to the floor, Rudy said over the roar of the engines as the Osprey screamed over the hull of the Imperial ship, the two vessels' shields sparking as they interacted. The Osprey skimmed the much larger vessel's bow faster and closer than its guns could track, then shot over the lip of the flared forward section. Like all Adjudicator-class ships, the bulk of the Justicar's weapons were on the wide mushroom-top forward section. It had far more armor since the ship was designed to rush head-on into battle, 
its wide forward section providing cover for smaller frigates and corvettes. The lateral gun batteries opened up, a few getting in lucky strikes against the Osprey's weakened shields. In seconds, the small, far more nimble ship was past the massive cruiser. They passed the powerful engines and angled to move into the ion wash, hiding them from the bigger ship's sensors. Jax looked over his shoulder. Rudy was using a small fire extinguisher to put out a flame under the usually unused third console on the small flight deck. Easy, he said, turning around and making a few course adjustments before powering up the wormhole generator, causing the Osprey to leap into the swirling vortex of space-time leaving the Imperials light years behind them in minutes. No place like home. The station customs official is outside the ship, Skip reported. It's Lewis. The Osprey was still ticking and pinging as it warmed up from the near-absolute zero of space. Her engines were powered down, and her reactor was already in standby. The heavy external doors of the Caruso family mechanical bay were still grinding closed as the boarding ramp lowered. The static pressure barrier that kept the atmosphere from escaping the bay sparkled just inside the track of the door. A loud clang announced the full closing of the large doors. Jax turned to Rudy. Let's go say hi to Lewis. He stood and headed for the stairs. Skip, lower the ramp, please. By the time Jax and Rudy reached the cargo hold, Lewis was walking around holding a scanning device, aiming it at the ship. When the human and droid arrived, the pudgy customs man turned. Hey, Jax, welcome home. He walked over to Jax, hand extended. After the two shook hands, the customs inspector continued, holding up his scanner. So, a mariposa it looks like, and then... He tapped the screen a few times. Oh, Relief Corps Station 9. He looked at Jax. Anywhere else that maybe you forgot to log in your official filing? Jax affected a stricken look. Lewis, my man, have I ever left things out of my customs declarations? He put both hands on his chest, elbows out, his head tilted to the side. The other man guffawed. Like almost every time you dock, Jax, it's like your thing. The other man reached into one of the many pockets of his station-issued pale blue coveralls and removed a data stick inserting it into the side of his scanning device. Well, nothing comes up on scans, so whether you went anywhere else or not, you didn't bring anything back, so welcome home. The man turned to head back down to the boarding deck, then said over his shoulder, There's a dart competition tonight at Wendy's, just saying. He waved one hand over his head as the heavy personnel hatch slid open, revealing the corridor beyond. Jax watched Lewis disappear, then turned to Rudy. Guess I know what I'm doing tonight. You want to come with? The droid spun his squat cylindrical head in a full 360 degrees. Me? Did you just ask me to come with you? You make it sound like I've never invited you to tag along before, Jack said. He turned and headed up the boarding ramp. Rudy followed, zipping up the center of the stairwell. When Jax reached the lounge and crew berth deck, he headed for his room. I'm going to get changed. Skip, go ahead and power down the ship. I'll hook up the umbilical before I leave. Roger that. Have fun, the ship's SI replied. Where the angry spacer was a bar tourists would avoid after being told about it, Wendy's was a bar they'd never be told about. Rumor had it, it was started by one of the founding families. Why it was called Wendy's, no one seemed to remember anymore. No one working there was named Wendy, and as far as station records were concerned, none of the founding families had a Wendy. Wendy's was on the lower decks of Kelso Station, near the reactor complex. The reactors made G-phones fritz out, and even the station's data network for tablets was spotty at best, usable only when one of the reactors was offline for maintenance. Well, if it isn't Jax Caruso, someone shouted as Jax and Rudy entered the dive bar. The voice was a deep basso. Rudy made a groan-like sound. I thought they'd be gone longer, he turned. Bye. Marshal Delfino made his way through the crowd. He walked over. His smirk made it clear he hadn't forgotten the last time he saw Jax a few weeks ago. He was a big man, mostly muscle 
and at least a head taller than Jack's. Hey, Marshmallow, how you been? Jack looked around the dimly lit bar. Rudy drifted over to where two other navigation droids were parked in a corner. Jax continued. Where's your bro? The other man shrugged, his muscular frame causing his jumpsuit to strain in the shoulders. Picked up a spacer chaser on Berkeley, the giant man chuckled. I warned him, but he was in a funk and needed a little boost, know what I mean? Now he's pretty much glued face down to the toilet. Been there two days now. He barked out a rough laugh and slapped a meat paw down on Jax's shoulder. Where you been? Jax winced and slipped out from under the heavy hand. Picked up a job, moving folks from Mariposa to a corporate station. So, you have the money you owe us? The previous joviality vanished from Marshal Delfino's face. Don't hustle a hustler. Jax grinned. I heard there was a darts thing tonight. Let's talk about money after, yeah? He moved to walk around the wall of muscle, only to have that familiar meaty paw land on his shoulder again. Sure, but don't forget what happened last time. The hand that was on Jax's shoulder moved to Marshall's face to lightly touch his eye. Jax mimicked the move, touching his still a little tender eye. The black and blue had faded with the swelling, but touching it still reminded him of his last encounter with the Delfinos. He nodded and moved past the big man. The back of the bar was just as crowded as the front, except for a narrow strip between a single tall table and dartboard mounted to the bulkhead. Jax approached a small woman with an inexpensive artificial eye. The cheaper stuff tended to not so much replace things as augment. Most of the hardware for her eye was mounted to her shaved scalp. The mechanical eye saw him before its organic counterpart did. She smiled. I wasn't sure you'd be around. Big pot tonight? Jack smiled and knelt to embrace the woman in a hug. Laz, you know I'd never miss one of your tourneys, he stood. What's the buy-in? Two grand. Two? Does that come with special privileges later or something? Jax asked, incredulous. Laz grinned. If you'd like, but that wouldn't even be an add-on. She winked her regular eye, but something in the wiring of the artificial one made the interior illumination blink three times rapidly. Jax did his best to hide his reaction to the come on. What's the pot up to? Forty grand. Jax pulled his G-phone out of his pocket. I'm in. He tapped on the icon for his banking software and sent the 2,000 Imperial credits to Laz. She consulted her own G-phone and nodded, walking away. She waved a hand over her head. We start in ten. She pointed to a board on the near bulkhead. Line up is there. Rudy rolled up alongside Jax. You gonna need me? Jax looked down. Oh, now you're back. Hot date with a lady droid? Something like that, idiot. The droid rolled off. Jax noticed a bright blue nav droid falling in with Rudy as he rolled away. This droid had three wheels. Use protection, Jax shouted only to receive a rude gesture from a three-fingered mechanical hand as Rudy and his friend vanished into the crowd. Jax managed to dodge the wall of human muscle called Marshal Delfino most of the night. The darts tourney went about as Jax expected. He cleaned up early on, but then realized why the lone Delfino brother was so easy to avoid. Christ! Jax hissed under his breath as the massive Delfino brother walked over, both huge hands on the shoulders of Corey Lightning. A damned ringer, Jax groaned. Should have known better. He turned to where Laz perched on a bar stool. She winked. Corey Lightning shrugged off the meaty paws of the larger Delfino brother and walked over to Jax. Been a while, Caruso. She stood, one hand on her hip, the other clutching a long, thin dart. Her brown eyes twinkled slightly in the flickering lights of alcohol signs. Jax put on his best fake smile. You too, Lightning. Haven't seen you on Kelso in a while. You haven't been missed. The woman smiled, turning to toss her dart, striking a perfect bullseye. Found a pretty sweet gig on Jericho Station, working security for the owner. The board lit up, and a whistle came from somewhere. 
So what brings you back here? Jax walked over to the table with the darts on it, picking up two. He threw each one at a time. An inner bullseye and an outer, the board lit up again. Boss was visiting Earth and didn't need me, so I figured I'd come see my old friends. She turned to Marshall and blew him a kiss. I've been talking on and off to that big lug for a few months. Figured it was time to pay him a visit. So gross, Jack said, then added, Let's do this. He walked over and removed the three darts from the board, handing Corey her dart and keeping his too. She grabbed her remaining darts. She looked at Jack's. This will be quick. She tossed her first dart, outer bullseye. Jax lined up his shot. Just as he threw the dart, Corey sneezed. His dart struck just outside the bullseye in the single area. Damn it, he hissed, spinning. She grinned, then blew him a kiss. Bitch. Never bet against the house. Not looking good, man, Marshal Delfino bellowed after Cory Lightning threw her last dart. She was very much ahead in points. Laz walked over to Jax, pulling on his arm. Better luck next time, Jax scowled at the diminutive woman. You planned this, I assume? Knew that a rematch between Cory and I would draw some bets? How did I not know? The woman shrugged. Gal's gotta make a living, she turned to the crowd. Last throw. After the cheering died down, she pulled Jax down closer. I lucked out that you were off station until today. You got back just in time. Jax drained his beer. Glad I could help, he growled. He looked around, spotting one of the waitstaff. I need another. The server nodded and tapped something on his tablet. Less than a minute later, a droid that looked like a cross between a praying mantis and a koala bear expertly placed a new full bottle in his hand. Come on, throw your dart so you can lose, someone shouted. Jax looked around, couldn't tell who had said it. Shut the hell up, he shouted into the crowd, walking up to the throwing line. Better luck next time, Jaxy, Marshall barked. Corey, sitting on his knee at the bar, swatted his cheek. Jax flipped them both off. He took a deep breath, centering himself. He drew back his hand and let the dart fly. It sailed true right to the single area. Damn it! He hissed as the room erupted in cheers. Thirty minutes later, Jax was sitting at the bar, having paid Marshal Delfino most of what he owed the brothers, and watching the big man buy a round of drinks for everyone inside Wendy's with his winnings from the tournament. A hand draped over his shoulder. Cheer up. You've won plenty of these. Jax looked over to a woman he didn't recognize and patted the bar stool next to him. He motioned to the bartender. A drink for the lady. Jax rolled over and came face to face with the woman from the previous night. His eyes snapped open, taking in his surroundings. Not his berth on the Osprey or even the couch in the mechanical bay office. Hi, he said. She opened her eyes slowly. Hi, she sat slightly, holding the sheet near her throat. I won't lie. Usually at this point a guy has either snuck out as quietly as possible or is making me breakfast and coffee. She smiled. Jack sat up as well. Yeah, either of those things would be less awkward than this. She nodded, turning her head slightly to look at the pile of clothes near the door to the small single-room living space his clothes. Do you, uh, want breakfast? He scooted to the edge of the bed, raising the sheet to confirm his complete lack of clothing. Not really. I have to be to work in an hour, she said. She noticed his discomfort and turned to look at something on the wall opposite where Jax's clothes lay in a pile. He stood and walked over, slipping his trousers on as quickly as he could. I'll, uh, just see myself out. Um, thanks for last night. He looked over his shoulder. We should do it again sometime. She turned to look at him, smiling, just as he was buttoning up his pants. See you around, Jax. Uh, yeah, you too. He tried to recall if she'd even said her name, but couldn't for the life of him remember. 
The buzzing in his head made recall iffy at best. He looked pained. Tammy, she offered, rolling her eyes. He pulled on his T-shirt and pressed the door control, opening the door to her quarters. After slipping out, he leaned over to put his boots on. I was gonna say, Tammy, he mumbled. He fished the earpiece out of his jacket pocket, placing it in his ear. The smart material warmed slightly as it reformed to fit his ear canal securely. Rudy, you read me? Well, good morning, Casanova, the droid replied. Guessing your one-night stand woke up and kicked you out? Jax frowned. It was more of a mutual... Don't care, the droid interrupted. I heard from Sandor. He has a job, possibly a big one. Jax growled at being cut off but swallowed it, saying, Already? We just got in yesterday. What's the gig? He didn't say. Said to meet him at his office. The droid paused. I'm on my way there now from the bay. I'll meet you there. Gotta stop and get a coffee. She sounds like a terrible host, the droid quipped. Lisa, damn it, no, J Jessica, Jack snapped his fingers twice. Tammy was a fine host. Whatever, see you there. He tapped his ear to end the communication.